thanks for the for the invitation to come. So I'm going to talk about bulletproofs, which are short proofs for confidential transaction and and a lot more. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Boole from University College London, my advisor Dan Bonet, um, and uh, Andrew, Peter, and Greg, uh, who are Bitcoin core developers. So uh, also a small small disclosure: I'm I'm an advisor for. Uh, DAG Labs and Chia, and, and I especially want to thank DAG Labs who invited me to 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 come here, and <laughs> and who are also they're hiring. Uh, so if you want to get a job, uh, talk to Miles, who's over there in the blue shirt, uh, and he can definitely hook you up with a job. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, I also more. Advertisements. I'll actually get to the the real thing, but this is the advertisements you can't skip over. So uh, the the Stanford B uh, Blockchain Conference, which was formerly known as BPACE, is is something that we run at Stanford. Um, it will be in January and February, and it's a, a top, really a, a great academic conference. And uh, you can watch the videos, tinyurl.bpace videos from the previous two years, and and we have really really exciting talks, and you should. Um, if you have something, then you can you can submit it here and on up to October October sixteenth. It has to be academic uh, of some sort, and uh, this is also part of the Stanford Center for Blockchain Research, which is a new research initiative that we have started, where uh, really a lot of uh, faculty from not just from cryptography but in general from computer science in the Stanford uh, department, and, and I think a law professor as well, are getting more into blockchain research and and. I think this is really exciting, and you can at cbr.sanford.edu you can check out sort of what we do and, and all the pa papers will be posted there. And I think I'll also make a Twitter account to sort of you know for people who don't use the normal internet anymore and only Twitter. And so let's get to the the real thing, the uh, the um, the talk, and and the core thing of you know any. Blockchain is, is sort of the transaction system, and, and in this talk really it's, it's it's really almost independent of blockchains because what we're going to focus here on is uh, Bitcoin transactions or transactions in general, and this is what a normal Bitcoin transaction or sort of looks like if you go I think to blockchain.info, and you can see that there's you know some some inputs to the transactions, which are outputs of previous transactions and some some outputs here. And uh, the 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 one of the core conditions is that the sum of the outputs has to be less than the sum of the inputs. This is important because otherwise you could create money. So um, where does the difference go? Well, the difference happens to be is uh, going to be the fees. Um, so this goes to the miner for uh, verifying the transaction. And um, the count model things are a little bit different for Ethereum, but you know this is generally what it looks like for for most uh, cryptocurrency to have a, have a similar style of transaction. So um, what? How do we how do we check the validity of a Bitcoin transaction? Well, we have to check three things. First thing that the signature is correct, so that you know the person who is sending the money was actually authorized to do so. The second thing is that the inputs are in spent, so you cannot spend money twice. Um, and again, miners uh, are doing that. And then the third thing is this this validity condition, which is going to become important. So the sum of inputs is equal to the sum of outputs plus the fees. So Bitcoin is neither confidential nor anonymous. Even though you know Bitcoin gets touted as you know this thing that is great for privacy, it actually has a lot of flaws, and um, in the sense of privacy. And uh, what do I mean by anonymity? By anonymity, I mean sort of hiding who's paying whom. So if I'm a political dissident uh, and don't want you know the government to know who I'm paying, then you know in Bitcoin you can track which you know the the, the which address uh, sends to whom. The address might not be your real name, but there's been a lot of work on actually showing that uh, you know academic work on showing that. Um, uh, you can, you know, cluster addresses pretty well, and and then you know through through sophisticated analysis figure out sort of which address belongs to whom, or at least which addresses belong together. And uh, you know, this is not just academic. There's companies actually doing this, uh, you know, doing like specializing in, in Bitcoin analysis. The other thing that we reveal is is how much is being sent. So if you know someone knows, for example, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, and you know, we see who is paying whom. So 
uh, everyone can see the pair, the pay, and the value. And say I don't even care, you know, uh, I don't even care about hiding who I'm paying. Even the amounts being public is really, really problematic. So say, you know, I, I, uh, everyone knows that, say, you know, Stanford is my employer uh, or pays me, you know, a research salary. And, and, but say I don't want, you know, my salary to be public. If they sent me the money in Bitcoin, then everybody could, uh, and the, someone knows which one is Bitcoin's, uh, Stanford's address and which one is mine address, then they could see what my salary is. And uh, you would not write, like, you would not want your salary to be public. This seems like a fairly reasonable request. And the other thing is, you know, say I'm, I'm a business and, and I might not even, you know, be required, say I'm buying, you know, computers from HP or whatever, uh, then I might not care about, you know, like, it, it might be pretty obvious that I'm p sending money to HP, but it's an important business secret to say how much I'm paying them, right? The, the sort of the value per transaction. So, uh, one thing that we might want to hide is, you know, really hiding the value, uh, hiding sort of this thing, how much is being sent. So um, to, to resolve this, there's been this proposal of so-called confidential transaction by, I think, Greg Maxwell first came up with this. Uh, however, this is sort of, you know, old pre-Bitcoin digital systems all had some notion of, of sort of stronger privacy or stronger cryptographic uh, privacy. And uh, so what do we do here? Well, basically the idea is that instead of writing the, the, the uh, amounts in the clear, we're going to cryptographically sort of encrypt them or we're going to use something more precisely that is called a commitment. And what a commitment does is that I can commit to a number without um, telling you uh, the number. And basically this commitment is hiding. So you have no idea what number I committed to. But later on, I can only open it to be the thing that I've committed to prior. So if, if I committed to five, I can only open it to five later, not anything else. So I will commit to all of the amounts, and uh, concretely we'll have, you know, we'll have the, so the outputs and the inputs here, and the fee is still in the public because the miners need to see that. And um, we'll concretely use these, these so-called Patterson commitments. They have the nice property that you can take two commitments and sort of aggregate them and get a commitment to the sum. So, you know, we'll, we'll sort of use that later. This is heavily used in these confidential transactions. So the problem right now is, well, say I want to check that this transaction is valid. I can still check the signature. I can still check that the inputs aren't spent. But how do I check this uh, condition, right? I, I, no one, the miners cannot see what the amounts are anymore. And it turns out that there's actually a second condition. Even if I could check this, this wouldn't be enough. Because there's a sort of a second condition. Because say you know one output is uh, uh, two thousand dollars, and the other one, or say one one output is five thousand bitcoin, and the other one is minus uh, three thousand bitcoin, then you know this the this check would still go through, but obviously this shouldn't be valid. You shouldn't have like a negative amount and a larger positive amount because then you wouldn't use the negative amount and would have sort of you know created money out of thin air. So the second check that the outputs are positive is actually the more difficult one. And that's uh, what we'll focus on in this talk. So, you know, these confidential transactions, they have the nice property that they're fairly simple. They're structured like Bitcoin transactions. They're sort of in that format. It would be, uh, they're, 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 I guess, compatible with Bitcoin. Uh, you would still, the transaction graph, so who's paying whom is still public. Um, but how do we do this public verifiability of transaction validity? Well, luckily, you know, cryptography can come to the rescue with something called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So what is that? Well, say, you know, Peggy, the prover, wants to commit Victor the verifier that this commitment C is a commitment to uh, a positive number X. Um, and what they can do is they can run sort of a, a, a challenge response protocol. So Victor gets to ask a lot of questions and uh, Peggy has to answer these questions. And at the end of it, um, Peggy, Victor is convinced that Peggy knows the answer. So she couldn't have answered the questions without knowing, sort of without this statement being true. However, the answers reveal nothing about what X is. So the only thing you learn is that this statement is true, but you learn nothing about why it is true. So uh, no idea what X is, but it's positive and Peggy must actually know it. So that's why it's called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So zero additional information gets transmitted, 
Um, but I still can prove to you that I, I know the secret. So, um, you know, and this is called, concretely, this is called arranged proof. Proving that a number is positive, I do by uh, basically proving that it is in some small range and that you won't have overflows. Um, so what we actually care about, though, in the blockchain setting, you know, this interaction is 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 is, is nice and cute, but um, you know, who would do would like who would do this interaction? Do you like talk to all the miners? You know, this is sort of difficult to handle. So what we really need is a non-interactive zero knowledge proof of knowledge, also called a NISIC. And here, the the prover Peggy can just write down pi using you know the secrets here, and uh, then Victor can just read pi and check it. Of course, like you know, a computer would do this, but uh, this is what is called a <laughs> zero knowledge uh, a NISIC. Uh, and you need something called for all NISICs, you need something called a reference string, which both uh, Peggy and Victor have access to. And I'll talk about that in a second why that is important. And with the zero knowledge proofs, you can do uh, a lot of other cool things rather than you know just proving that uh, you know something is in a range. You can, for example, you know, there's this, this system called zero cash, and the commercialization is Zcash, um, which where you prove that I know sort of, you know, you say you ha we have a Merkle tree of all of the coins that have ever come into existence, and say, uh, and each Merkle tree leaf is a commitment of uh, sort of the the the, the coins. So it's an or it's a commitment of the coins. So it's similar. Uh, Similar to what we had before, and say I want to um, hide who I'm, who which coins I'm paying, which coins I'm sending you. Well, what I can do is I can do a zero knowledge proof of this statement. So I know two Merkle paths to two unspent coins, and here are the two new coins such that the sum of the old coins is equal to the sum of the new coins. So this fairly complex statement you can encode in, in sort of uh, math, and you can do a zero knowledge proof of that, and that is exactly what Z Zcash does. And um, decides the re sender, the receiver, and the amount. By the way, if there are any questions throughout, please please go ahead and ask. Do you mind explaining just a little bit what's a Merkle tree? Um, so a Merkle tree is uh, it actually doesn't in this case it doesn't really matter because it, it it would be okay if we just have a list of all of the coins. Um, sort of a Merkle tree we only use here for efficiency. Um, However, you know what is a Merkle tree? It's it's sort of a very short, um, it's a short data structure where I can, uh, you know, where I have sort of this this one hash, and I can very easily give you sort of a short proof that something is in that list. Okay, so here is a is a list of things L1 through L4, and I can very efficiently log in logarithmic sort of with logarithmic data convince you that you know this L1 was committed to in, in this Merkle tree hash. Um, and this shows up all over Bitcoin. But, but it's, it's a transaction, transaction record. Like a historical transaction, transaction record. record. Yeah, so that uh, a historical transaction record would do, be, do and the Merkle tree is just is just the data structure that, that is being used. It's the very efficient data structure that is used all over Bitcoin. Um, because you can do a very efficient inclusion proof. So I can tell you that I commit to, I have a set, and then I want to efficiently tell you that something is in the set, uh, so I can, you know, convince you that. But, um, so how do I do a range proof? Well, let's do uh, sort of conceptually, or how was, how was uh, were range proofs done previously? Well, basically, uh, how, what does it mean that something is in a range? So that, you know, it is, uh, say, I want to prove to you that x has between, uh, is between 0 and 2 to the n. Well, or 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. Well, what that means is that I can write x with n bits. Okay? x is an n bit number. Okay? So the bit is either 0 or 1, and I can write sort of, you know, uh, in binary form, uh, I can write it between 0 and 1. And, uh, you know, the same as if we use decimal, then, you know, I could say, like, you know, the number, uh, if I prove to you something is between 0 and 999, then it means that I can write it with three digits. Um, so what I'm going to do as a prover is I'm going to commit to every bit. So I send you a commitment to each one of these bits. And they have this homomorphic property that I can sort of take these bits and, and verify that the, the commitment to the to total sum is actually 
made up of, of these commitments. So it's the, the, the combination of these commitments. And then what does the proof say? Well, the proof says that, uh, you know, here's this, this sort of sum condition. And then the other part that the proof says is that each bit is either, either zero or one. So it is actually a bit. So that's the, that's how I do this, uh, range proof. However, what's the problem with it? Well, the bigger my range gets, the bigger my proof gets, and especially grows linearly. So if I want to do a 64-bit range proof, this is already 4 kilobytes, even with, with some improvements by, by uh, the block stream guys. And uh, it's, it's linear in, in, in the length of the range. So if we wanted to prove something about 128 bits, then you know, we would need 8 kilobytes. Um, the benefit is that it doesn't have a trusted setup. And I'll talk about that more in a second. So what is another proof system that we could use? Well, there are these uh, pre-processing snarks, succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, but uh, they, and they have a so-called trusted setup. So what does this mean? Well, these are the, these really efficient proof systems where you have a, a, a setup guy who sort of encrypts the queries to the prover in, in a special way, and then also encrypts the answers, like very succinct answers, uh, and, and gives that to the verifier. And then the prover can compute a small proof, um, a pi, and uh, this is the compressed response to the queries, and, and Victor can verify this very efficiently. And I think, you know, currently sort of the best snark is like 128 bytes. And the amazing thing is that uh, sort of the proof size is 128 bytes, no matter how complex your statement is. This is like truly amazing. And, and checking it takes 10 milliseconds, really, no matter what. This is, uh, um, you know, this is amazing. So why, why didn't we just use snarks? Well, the problem is that if the prover is malicious, uh, if the setup is malicious, so if there's not, you know, some nice guy, then uh, he can, uh, the setup can collude with the prover and create a fake proof. So I can prove to you that a number is positive, or even if it's not positive. Um, and so this is, you can create cheating proofs. So this is very dangerous. And there's sort of no way to check whether a proof is, 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 is fake or whether it's real. So what is the problem with trusted setup in cryptocurrencies? So the problem is that uh, you can create these fake proofs, but what does that mean, right? So zero cash is actually using snarks. What if the, the, their trusted setup was subverted, was uh, fake? Well, then, if you, it's the, the subversion is undetectable, so if I can create a fake proof in Zcash, I can print money out of thin air. I can make a transaction without actually having money, right? I can send myself new coins that I didn't have before. So uh, this is undetectable, but still, the, the, the hiding property is still there. So no one can see this. So undetectable inflation is probably the worst possible outcome for a cryptocurrency because it means that an attacker can sort of e extract as much money from the system as he wants, right? He creates new coins, sells them, and the exchange slowly lowers the exchange rate. And, and it's, really, it's, it's really hard to tell even that this is going on. Um, and even the fear of this undetectable inflation is dangerous, right? Say, you know, you don't have this undetectable inflation, but say, you know, there's people now saying on the internet, hey, you know, whatever, the trusted setup is broken uh, and, and they don't uh, trust it, then, you know, other people might not trust it and might be w less willing to accept the currency because you don't know really how many units of it exist. And uh, why sort of, you know, why is that not a problem for Zcash? Or, you know, it might be a small problem for Zcash, but no, you know, no serious person believes that the Zcash tr setup is broken. And the reason why is because they did a lot of work in, in sort of distributing the setup. So they, they distributed it among a large number of people. I think they're doing a new one now with like 40 people. Um, so as, as long as at least one of these 40 people uh, is honest, then the setup is okay. So they like would have all needed to collude um, to, to, to uh, create this. And, and this is highly, you know, no one actually believes this, but you know, even even Zika says they they rather not have the setup, which you know they call like toxic waste. Um, and this is expensive and difficult to be done for Zcash. And the biggest problem is also that every time they do a protocol upgrade, you know, every time they change anything, they need to do a new setup. You know, and this is very expensive. 
And what is even worse is say, you know, I want to do something like smart contracts, where sort of every transaction looks a little bit different. Well, then, you know, this in, in Hawk, which is sort of private smart contracts or a proposal for private smart contracts, there needs to be a different setup for every uh, smart contract. And th this now really doesn't seem reasonable. Um, you know, that's why you haven't seen a Hawk ICO yet. Um, probably. Uh, so, you know, we would really like to have something without a trusted setup. So, this is why we designed Bulletproof, which uh, builds on previous work from, from Jens Grothus group at, at University College London, who's really also the, the father of, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the first paper on SNARKs was by him. So, he's done amazing work on, on, on sort of zero knowledge proofs. And I think the first and the latest paper on SNARKs. Um, and uh, so this previous work had already no trusted setup, which was why it was interesting, and only uses the so-called discrete logarithm assumption, which is a very well-known sort of assumption that is sort of it's the same thing that ECDSA signatures use, um, or it's even better slightly, um, internal signatures. And so we build on this work, and, and we use their, uh, uh, so they had an, this inner product argument, and when we approved on it, uh, and so what is this inner product argument? Well, basically, say I have two vector, a hash of two vectors and a scalar, I can prove to you that the inner product, so this is like, you know, you t I take the element-wise product and then sum it up, uh, is, is this third thing that I'm committing to. Uh, and basically, our proof for this thing is two log n elements, and the previous one was six log n, and uh, the verification, though, so this, is, this is a short proof. The verification, though, is linear in, in n. So um, the proof is short, but verification takes a, a longer time. And this is as opposed to SNARKs, where the verification is uh, constant time, and the proof is also constant time. However, the downside of SNARKs, again, is right, like bulletproofs do not have a trusted setup. We also did a lot of work on, on b proving things about committed values. Uh, so why would I care about that? Well, like this range proof was again, right? It was, uh, I wanted to prove to you that this is important for range proofs, where I wanted to prove to you that a committed value is in some range. So we made that easy. And then uh, we have this multi-party computation for proof creation, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which means that multiple parties can create one proof together without telling each other their secrets. And uh, batch verification, which means that I can verify sort of the, uh, two proofs faster than two times verifying one proof, which gives us a lot of uh, benefits and, and makes this a lot more practical. And then in total, sort of the numbers that we get is, is two log n plus nine elements for range proof. But bulletproofs is not just good for range proofs. I can prove things about arithmetic circuits, which means sort of an arbitrary function which I, you know, I have to write it as you know, multiplications and additions, but basically you can do this for any function. Uh, and I can prove to you uh, that this function was sort of executed correctly using 2 log n plus 13 elements. So what is the effect of this? Well, so uh, this was the previous sort of proof for one transaction. So I wanted to prove to you that, that one, one range proof, so one uh, uh, sort of one output is correct. It was like four kilobytes. Um, and SNARKs are 188. I think that's even 128 bytes now. I need to update <laughs> this. Uh, so, um, and uh, Bulletproofs is, uh, comes in at 672 bytes. So also very short uh, compared to the sort of range proof. And the nice thing is that usually a transaction has two outputs, right? You send some money to someone else and something, uh, back to yourself, and then I need to prove that both of them are in, in the range. So um, the, I can you know, um, do this with only you know, logarithmic scaling, so it only adds 64 bytes, uh, versus the previous one, which, which grows linearly, it's not like stay low. You know, I can you know, play the same game. Uh, the same game, and you know, for 10 minutes, we get to 3.8 like 40 kilobytes versus, you know, le still less than a kilobyte. Um, so if I have 10, 10 range proofs, so if I've, you know, sent my whole family something. Uh, in order for the proof size to, to grow in that order, do you need the same prover or someone, 
some external one can aggregate the different coefficients? Uh, that's a very good question, and I'll get back to that later. So this right now, uh, it only works for if you have the same grouper. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about how we can sort of circumvent that. Um, so the other thing is, right, I could said I can do proofs for, for these arbitrary arithmetic circuits, you know, there's a log log scale, and uh, we can see that, you know, full proofs uh, grows logarithmically, so what is this number? This is the Zcash new circuit, comes in at about 1.3 kilobytes, and you'll be hard-pressed to sort of, you know, push bulletproofs for any reasonable size computation over 2 kilobytes. And Starks uh, are uh, much larger, right? They also scale sort of asymptotically, they're very nice, but sort of practically the proofs are, are very, very large. However, the verification time for Starks, at least for big statements, you know, also growth uh, is, is better than, than bullet proofs. Uh, but, you know, they're like at least over 100 kilobytes or maybe even over 200 kilobytes. Um, and so it wouldn't be re very reasonable to add a stock per transaction. Like that, I don't think that, yeah. Could you touch on how uh, Ligero compares to these? Um, yeah, uh, so Ligero is also in the sort of more in the stark realm of, of sizes. So it's much, much, much larger. Um, there's, in general, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, well, yeah, actually the next slide is, uh, the verification time, by the way, versus snarks here is about a factor of 10 slower. And so, uh, I'll, I'll touch on Ligero in a second. Let's first compare sort of these things. You know, we have bulletproof, we have sigma protocols, which was used before, Stark, snarks, and uh, yeah, they all, right, it's not, there's no clear winner. You know, each of them have, have, have sort of benefits and downsides. Like, snarks are amazing in terms of uh, proof size and and verification time, but they have this trusted setup and uh, these very strong cryptographic assumptions that uh, we're sort of less comfortable with. Bulletproofs are, are, are very short, you know, they don't have this trusted setup, you can do the batch verification, but you have linear verification time, and, and like SNARKs, they use also public key cryptography, which means sort of they're, they're, they're broken against a quantum computer. If someone comes up with a quantum computer, they can break sort of uh, these things, but they couldn't, or it wouldn't be as easy to break Starks. Uh, and Starks, you know, are, are really nice asymptotically, but practically the proofs are very large. And, and sort of, it's, it's, it's more complicated, or, you know, uh, at least they only really are useful for large statements, and then for these large statements, the prover is fairly expensive. So that's the, that's the downside. And there's many more sort of points in the trade-off space. There's Hyrex, VSGL, Ligero, which have, uh, you know, the, the trader says really high dimension and they have different benefits. So Ligero's main benefit is that it's also uh, resistance against uh, quantum computers. Um, and it has a, a practically a very, very fast prover uh, because it only uses sort of hashes and, and is, is a very simple sort of simpler construction than Starks and, and is, is pretty fast in that. Uh, but the proofs are, again, like fairly large. Me sort of does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So verification time. I'll 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 get into that in more of a second. So the downside is that the verification time uh, of bulletproofs is is linear in the size of the statement. So the more complex the thing is that I'm trying to prove, the the larger it gets. And uh, this is not the case for Starks or Snarks. Uh, so there you only have sort of, it grows logarithmically or log, polylog, and for Snarks it, it, it stays the same. And we'll see the, the effects of that in a, in a second. It turns out though that, you know, so asymptotically if you prove something very complicated, it, it gets bad. But practically for sort of uh, some of these things that we care about, like the confidential transactions, it's actually very, very good, right? There's a difference sort of between how the slope grows and, and where it starts off. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a, that's a different, it's an interesting property. <laughs> um, I believe that, that, you know, I, I, I believe that there's still uh, improvements to be done. Um, but the, uh, they will never, I, I would be extremely surprised if we get Stark 
sort of in that one to two kilobyte range where you can uh, attach them to a transaction. Uh, the proving and verification time is always, you know, for any of them, right? If you have hardware that does it, you can do anything, right? Like, you know, uh, build an ASIC that produces a snark or stark, and I think or a bulletproof, you, you know, the world would be a better place. Um, you know, I think that sort of that is like th those things you can prove. The proof size is is much harder to improve, right? That is sort of um, more fixed, and and I think that you know, Starks. I would be surprised if we can get them into this, you know, into a range where they're. I think they're better for other applications. So, for example, you know, if I want to prove to you that the whole block is correct, I can do a Stark. Or you know, maybe at some point we'll have quantum computers. You know, this is probably far into the future, like, but, uh, and then, you know, the, the we, we can't use snarks and we can't use bulletproofs anymore, and so we might have to use something like Ligero or Stark. Yeah, proving time is, 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 is uh, a little bit more complex. I think that the proving time of bulletproofs is pretty much uh, similar to, to, to snarks. The benefit is that for, uh, Snarks, you need a large amount of memory, and for bulletproofs, you don't. So if you have a large amount of memory, then then snarks and bulletproofs are basically the same. Uh, it's, it's similar operations. Uh, but if you don't have the memory, then sort of if you're on a small memory device or the statement gets very large, then bulletproofs is better because you can do it without uh, the memory. And and with snarks as well, you need like the prover is. It really depends on the parameters whether it's expensive or not. Uh, but it definitely needs a large amount of memory because it has these FFT computations. Um, yeah. So uh, let's talk about the verification time. I, you know, uh, the checking the proof is this very really complicated, you know, a lot of complicated math. But basically, it boils down to to this multi exponentiation. Uh, so one large multi-exponentiation. So uh, what this means is I have a bunch of uh, sort of generators, like these are these are elliptic curve points, and I need to raise them to some scalars and then just check whether this one equation is one. So it doesn't really matter uh, if you understand, but I'm I'm going to show you sort of like maybe a trick that you can even from this uh, appreciate. Or so say I have two proofs. Okay, say I want to prove that, you know, this proof 1a is equal to 1, and this proof b is equal to 1, okay? And what it turns out is that, you know, most of these things, n of these things, so say n is a million, then, you know, a million of these things are the same for both of these proofs. They're sort of fixed in the, in the, the, the CRS, and then, what? What is CRS? It's the common. It's sort of the the. Uh, it's the common reference string. It's so basically when uh, it's this information that both of the prover and the verifier need to have available. Um, it, it, it it's sort of like just think of it as being fixed for all time into the future. Like this is um, yeah. This is just the parameter of. It's a parameter of the proof system that is sort of fixed for all time. Uh, but these L and R's they're they're different in every proof. But say n is a million, then we have sort of two million of these and uh, forty of these, you know. Um, so what can we do? Well, we want to check both of these uh, equations. So we want to check that a is equal to one and b is equal to one. However, it turns out that I can also, as a, uh, if I want to check that, I can sample an alpha from a large space, you know. So alpha with like two hundred fifty-six bit, or no, actually just forty bits is enough. Um, and I, then I can also check that a times b to the alpha is equal to 1. And clearly, this implies this. However, it turns out that uh, with large probability, this implies this. If alpha was truly chosen randomly, then the second equation here implies the first equation. Okay. Um, so why, why, you know, that's cute and all, but why does this help us? Well, it turns out that then we can combine the exponents here uh, and instead of doing, you know, all of these together, uh, all, all of these uh, exponentiations, we can just sort of uh, do uh, these small operations on these scalars and then do the exponents. We can't quite do that here. Um, so why is this helpful? Well, 
this exponentiation is really expensive, but the multiplication here is cheap. So we just traded a bunch of expensive operations for uh, a lot of cheap ones. And uh, so what's the effect of this? Well, this means that verifying two proofs is faster than twice verifying one proof. And in general, sort of, there's this, this batch verification where, say I receive a, a block with a bunch of transactions, and I want to check all of the proofs in the block, I can do that faster than checking each one individually. Okay, so this is going to help. And what does this mean concretely? Well, say I want I have a confidential transaction with two outputs, then you know checking the the first check is going to be six point two milliseconds, and then every additional check is five hundred fifty microseconds, so more than a factor of ten faster. So now we come back to to sort of the question that Adele had in the beginning. Well. You know how, like, bulletproof really does best if you know we have many many outputs uh, per transaction. So how can you get transactions with a lot of outputs, right? Um, the you know you could bundle your own transactions, or you know like if you're sending your whole family money or whatever, you know then you can you can have a transaction with many outputs if you have a large family. Um, but you know this is not maybe the normal use case. But at every any given point in time, there's going to be multiple people that want to create a transaction. So what if they could sort of work together? So what if uh, and create one proof for all of their transactions? Then you know you would get sort of a and this is called usually a coin join, right? So how can we sort of enable coin joins? Well, what we would like to do have is for these peggies to they they would like to prove something about C1, C2, and three, and you know do a range proof for each of them. And uh, they don't want to reveal their secrets to each other. They could do that, but they, they probably don't want to do that. So the trivial solution is they can just concatenate the proofs. So you know you just have three proofs. But that is not nice. So uh, we can do something called a multi-party computation, which is this amazing cryptographic tool that you know you it works in general. Where say all of us want to compute our average salary, then we can do that such that we, the only thing we learn is the average salary and nothing else. Um, so, and you know, we you can do this for arbitrary functions, not just an average. Um, so, how do we do this MPC? Well, we 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 designed these generic MPCs are pretty expensive, but we designed sort of a custom one for this protocol. And this works if you know everyone has sort of a different statement that they want to prove, and we want to combine them. And uh, well, this is basically how you do it uh, uh, technically. And, and so I can either have a logarithmic number of rounds of communication. So this is sort of a logarithmic number of rounds. Each one needs to send something uh, in every round and, and very little communication. But sort of rounds are expensive because there's like latency in the network. So you can also do three rounds and, and linear or sort of uh, large communica larger communication, which is probably the better trade offs. Or there's anything in the middle. You know, I can do four rounds and, and N over two communication and five rounds and N over four communication. So, um, yeah, so that's that's uh, sort of a nice thing that will sort of enable uh, uh, the the benefits of bulletproof really to sh to shine and and uh, yeah, which which can sort of it's, it's the cool thing is now also right like if you think about it, coin join has generally been proposed for um, for adding anonymity right. Confidential transactions does not help with anonymity as is. But now there's an economic incentive, right? You will pay lower fees if you do a coin join. So your anonymity suddenly now gets better. You can say, yeah, right now if you do a coin join, you're immediately suspicious, right? Your coins are probably marked, you know, by, by if the FBI is watching the blockchain, you know, then they probably, you know, think like the first thing as I do is I look at all the coin joins, right? Because you wonder why why does someone want to mix their coins? Why want to give there? So this is terrible for anonymity because you know then suddenly I'm also disincentivized to do a coin join because you know I have to do it with uh, all of these people that have more sort of more tainted coins. Um, and uh, now there's also an, now if there's an economic incentive, right? If if I have to pay lower fees to do a coin join, this sort of will 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 help everyone uh, because the privacy of everyone will get better. And the other thing is that coin join with Bitcoin right now is really problematic because, say, you know, I put in uh, half a Bitcoin, 
someone else puts in 0.3 Bitcoin and someone else puts in 7 Bitcoin, you know, and then I see two outputs, one with 7, one with 0.3 and one with 0.5. Well, it's pretty easy to sort of figure out which one belongs to which, right? And you can be a little bit smart about it. But uh, with confidential transactions, if you hide the amount that goes in and the amount that goes out, then sort of all of the inputs are indistinguishable and all of the outputs are indistinguishable. So CoinJoin becomes a lot better. And, and there's been great work on, on sort of, uh, it's called Value Shuffle by Tim Ruffing on, on how, how to do that. And uh, Bulletproof plays really, really nicely with that. So. Um, what are the applications for bulletproofs? Well, you know, the one that I talked the mo most about is, is the sort of confidential transactions. And, you know, again, you know, if we can get 16 range within, it's 928 bytes versus 61 kilobytes. So we a lot, lot better than the previous solution. And verification is also faster than the, let's say, than the previous solution. Um, and, you know, if I want to double the precision, it adds 64 bytes. So it, it you know, uh, this is really nice as well. Previously, uh, confidential transactions were proposed with 32 bits of precision, which you know makes things really difficult, and you need to round, and and it sort of yeah, it adds difficulty, and and you know with both sort of the cost of doing 64 bits is is hardly uh, noticeable. And you know the the what would this mean? Say you know in 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 the current UTXO set. Assuming that every transaction had a confidential was confidential and had a proof attached to it, and this would be previously this would have been 160 gigabytes, and and with full proofs this is, would be 17 gigabytes, and this doesn't even assume a change in user behavior, right? This doesn't even assume more more sort of coin joins, but you know we still have this protocol, a built-in simple coin join protocol for combining confidential transactions. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah. No, if the UTXO set, if every, if you sort of attach a range proof, if you attach an old range proof to every UTXO in Bitcoin, it would be 160 gigabytes. This is, this is a, just a sort of a number estimation game. Against seventeen against seventeen gigabytes with bulletproofs, so it's like it's the assumption like say Bitcoin switched to confidential transactions and only the yeah if if had, if Bitcoin had done confidential transactions since you know uh, two thousand nine uh, and and sort of nothing else changes so if that is the only variable would change then uh, the UTX all set you know would would be one hundred sixty gigabytes because each of them needs to have you know. Uh, uh, a confidential uh, a range proof attached to it, and the, with bulletproofs it would be shorter. It would be like seventeen gigabytes. And um, and this is also sort of if you use Mimblewimble, then uh, the only thing really that you keep around is the UTXO set, that is sort of the whole blockchain. So there, these numbers would be actually the size of the blockchain, plus minus. You know, this is a very rough estimation. It's shorter. Is the <laughs> Point. <laughs> uh, oh, this is this 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 protocol um, that appeared on the internet by some anonymous person. Um, I want to talk about the details, but it's this really really beautiful protocol where uh, which also works with confidential transactions, where you can sort of reduce, you can prune a, a lot of the transactions in the blockchain. And I only have to give you sort of the, the, the so-called kernel and, and the current UTXO set. And you can still check that the whole blockchain was done correctly. Um, and it's, it's, a uh, yeah, it's this really cool system where, uh, sort of that, that breaks blockchains to their very sort of core. And, and you can only do sort of, you only do transactions. Like it doesn't have a script, but, you know, there's been a lot of work showing on, on that, that is actually still very, very powerful and you can do sort of a lot of things that we like uh, with it. So, yeah, the, the um, it's called Mimbawimba, and there's, you know, some resource on, online also to read about it. But it was this guy named uh, Jedisor. Tom Elvis Jedisor. Tom Elvis Jedisor. Tom Elvis Jedisor, which is the French uh, name for, Voldem for, for Tom Riddle. So the Voldemort's old person who put this up on a pseudonym and, and then vanished and, you know, uh, so, yeah. <laughs>
very cool. And Mimbo Wimbo is some spell in Harry Potter as well, I think. Um, so uh, Monero is actually, they, they have these confidential transactions. And so they said, like, uh, you know, for them, this is a, a sort of clearly bulletproof is better. So they uh, said, like, oh, yeah, we're going to implement this. And they're sort of very close to, to, to actually uh, having this. And, you know, they said, uh, here's a quick update on bulletproofs and the role in Monero. Bottom line, they're awesome. They work, the fees are lower, and they're moving into testnet. So we were very happy about that, you know. We put up the paper and, and you know, within a year of the paper being public, uh, someone might, you know, this might secure, I don't know how much Monero is worth, but like north of a billion dollars. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, and then sort of, you know, there's, okay, oh. Question, uh, do I understand correctly that the both probes are really to hide the, to, for confidential transactions, basically the announced? Yeah. And the NPC coin journey is to hire the participant? No, you can do that, but that's not what Monero does. Monero does uh, a so-called... I'm not talking about Monero, I'm talking about the, the, the implication of Bitcoin. Yeah, so, I mean, um, the, the, the sort of the coin join is, is one way to sort of add more uh, sort of anonymity and hide the participant. However, it's, even that is not perfect, right? If you want sort of perfect privacy, you need to do something like Zcash. Uh, like zero cash, where where you where the anonymity set is really everything, the whole coin, the whole pass is the anonymity set. So it's sort of there's li different levels of privacy, and and you don't, uh, and it's you know it's it's an interesting question, sort of what is enough, what is good enough, and but you know the motivation for coin join is previously it's been only been privacy, and now it it gives you privacy, and sort of you know it makes it cheaper. Which is a, a really cool combination uh, because you know we we know that sort of like we have a lot of like you know there's a lot of research that that people are very sort of lazy in privacy and only really want privacy at the moment where they need it and then it's too late. Um, so making it sort of much more default and adding incentives for having privacy is I think is a great sort of thing uh, societal from a societal point of view. Isn't that the case in Zcash though? Uh, the S, S addresses and T addresses, so the S ones are smaller, so it's kind of the same incentive? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the problem is, well, no, in, in Zcash, I think, yeah, I think in Zcash, at least uh, right now, hardly anyone uses the, actually the privacy features of Zcash, and, and that is very problematic because 7%. But I think, though, this is, this is sort of a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, pretty convinced that the, that is a more temporary thing and has more to do with the sort of the usability of of the old Zcash system was very bad. Like you know, creating a transaction is like uh, almost a minute, and like you know, uh, I think that sort of with the new system, I hope at least that will get better. And also, the main thing is that you know, the, who the majority of transactions today is like probably exchanges, and and they don't want to deal with the sort of the privacy. So. But yeah, no, it's a problem, right? Like uh, your, your your anonymity set for using Zcash isn't actually that good. So, um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a tough challenge, and it's yeah, it also shows you that sort of if you don't have privacy by default, it's uh, not that you know not that powerful. Was there an attempt to do like something like a circuit that kind of fits like the whole thing in a bulletproof, and then the anonymity set is like everyone in the network? So that is exactly what Zcash is. Yeah, I know, but with both programs. Well, I'll, I'll come to it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, but Monero is doing this. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other application that I want to talk about is that we had this paper uh, back in 2015, actually, you know, that, you know, shortly after Mt. Gox went bankrupt, uh, we thought, like, wow, this is terrible, you know, what could have been done? Uh, and uh, there was this big question with Mt. Gox, you know, are they solvent? Uh, and there was like for a long time, you know, people who were around then uh, and, you know, and had money on Bitcoin, they had, like it wasn't clear whether they were solvent or not. And they were saying, you know, we're solvent, but like no one could really check. And, and uh, what we would have liked is sort of uh, or what we developed in, in, in uh, I think we call this, uh, we call the protocol provisions, is a way for exchanges to prove that they're solvent, like formally, mathematically prove that they're solvent without revealing any information. 
So while, without revealing uh, which Bitcoin addresses they control, which how much money each customer has, or even how much money they have in total, all of that uh, remains private. So it's a zero knowledge proof again. Um, and but still they can prove that they're sovereign. And we've been really trying hard for sort of exchanges to to adopt this, uh, but have not unfortunately succeeded yet. Uh, but if you know an exchange, or, you know, the, if you work at one, please check out the paper and come talk to me uh, on provisions because we really would like to see this be developed in practice. I think this is still relevant. And this is like, I really love this application because it's something that you might want for your normal bank, right? But it's just, Sort of the fact that the blockchain is public is the thing that enables this to be possible. For sort of a fiat bank, uh, you know, you can can't really. Uh, there's no sort of conceivable way of doing that because there isn't a public ledger of, of what the money is. And with bulletproof, you know, we'd reduce the proof size from 18 gigabytes to 62 megabytes. What, what does it mean? What does it mean to be solvent without proving that you're solvent without demonstrating? Yeah, so the, that's a that's a uh, it's a great question. Well, so what it means to be solvent means that sort of I have as an exchange I have liability or as a bank, right? Like it's an exchange is basically acting as a bank here. I have liabilities to my customers, so I owe all of my customers money, and we rely on the customers to check that they're included into the proof that their amounts are included, uh, and I ha also have some assets, right? I have Bitcoin, sort of. I own Bitcoin. I possess. I know private keys to Bitcoin addresses. So the 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 proof is basically proving that the sum of my assets is larger than the sum of my uh, this is larger than the sum of my liabilities. Without, Without but in zero knowledge. So n nothing I, again, right? And this is the the, the 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 magic of zero knowledge. I can prove to you that something is true without giving you any reason why it's true. I'm only proving to you that the sum of my assets is larger than the sum of my liabilities. And that is all you learn. No, nothing. No, nothing, no. Each, customer's, each customer knows themselves how much money they have on the exchange. So they check that. But other than that, nothing gets a read. That's, the, that's sort of the, you know, is a, uh, shows you the power of zero knowledge. But what if not all of the customers check? Um, that's a very good question. So the assumption is that the, if you don't check and the exchange can sort of, the, 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 the idea is that the exchange can't predict who's checking, right? Um, so if one person checks and it's, 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 you know, you're not included, then you raise sort of a red flag and, and post on, on the internet and uh, scream. And you can actually show then, hey, you know, like this is my balance, but it wasn't, Included into the proof. Um, well, the the whole thing gets like really, really. So the, the 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 protocol is sort of complicated in the sense that, say, even an exchange does a proof and and tells you, you know, they have enough money. An exchange having enough enough money does not uh, like has no sort of uh, implication on their willingness to pay it out, right? <laughs> You know, that's a, and, and, and the whole assumption is, you know, the whole assumption of the exchange is that users are unwilling to sort of, uh, or unable to sort of store a private key, right? That, that seems to be like difficult for users to do. And I don't mean that sort of, um, you know, this is actually really difficult. Like it, it like Bitcoin has shown many things, but one of the things is that, you know, it's, it's like, like storing a private key is really, really hard. Um, and not losing it. And, and, you know, uh, so, uh, basically, because of that, there's sort of fundamental limitations to solvency. <laughs> but basically, what it proves you is, you know, that, that at the very least, they can't sort of lose the money or lose their keys or, or get hacked. It basically, it's a protection against getting hacked. They can't get hacked and then still pretend like uh, they have enough money. But, yeah, and, and again, you know, you need to sort of assume that they can't predict which customers aren't included. But... You know, you, you probably have some incentive to check. And, you know, the, you would do this hopefully, you know, once a day. So, um, uh, yeah. But uh, let's uh, get on. I think, you know, we're almost, oh, but, oh, we're already ending the end of it. So, you know, you can also use Bulletproof for something called, this is an application outside of Bitcoin. So, um, these verifiable shuffles. So, 
basically, there's this old protocol for uh, these so-called mixed nets. We have a bunch of messages that go in and a bunch of messages that go out. So think of emails or transactions. And I want to hide who's paying whom, even among the participants. And they can do sort of this mixed net where you know everybody takes the list, encrypts it, shuffles it, and then outputs it. And there you need a bunch of basically NISICs that I shuffled the list correctly, sort of that, that two committed lists are, are, have the same values, or two encrypted lists have sort of the same values in it. And with Bulletproof, we can sort of do that very efficiently without a trusted setup. And then um, the, the other thing, you know, that another application is, uh, I guess, um, Actually, I'll skip over that. You could use Bulletproof for smart contracts. Um, <laughs> sort of the short thing, and, and you would have to use some, you have to be smart about how you use them because, you know, verification time takes long, but there's sort of tricks, this so called uh, referee delegation model, or you might have heard about Truebit, uh, that, that makes the verification sort of more efficient. And well, the. Well, the of, of chain entirely with something like the verification thing. Yeah, but that uh, only sort of uh, these zero knowledge contingent payments only sort of give you they don't uh, have the same power as smart contracts. Um, there I can like do atomic swaps, and and it works well for that. But uh, I can't sort of do you know in a smart contract I want to do communications like a lottery. You can't do a lottery with ZKCP. Um, either way. Uh, we implemented, uh, or you know, Andrew and Peter did a lot of great work of implementing uh, Bulletproof into into the Bitcoin core library, uh, Lipsec two five six k one, and you know, it's a really uh, great uh, implementation. There's other ones out there, you know, Java, Rust, and especially the Rust one by by Chaining. They did an amazing job on implementing it, you know, using an even better elliptic curve and and you know, using Intel hardware extractions, and I think it's twice as fast as the Lipsec implementation. So. Uh, you know, there's been it's it's been really cool to see sort of people picking this up and implementing this. Um, so what are the, you know, we talked about verification time, and I promised to show some numbers. So say we 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 you know this is sort of number of of, of range proofs, so number of outputs to the transactions, and we see, you know, this is the proving time in, in milliseconds, um, and here's the verification time, and here we see sort of the the benefit of of batch verification, as this purple line. And say I had 16, you know, an, a transaction with 16 outputs. Then it turns out that the batch verification time is basically equivalent to checking 16 ECDSA signatures, which is what you would have to do today in Bitcoin. So, you know, this is of course, you know, like with the right parameters, but basically it means that, that you know, verifying bulletproofs is not that much more expensive than checking ECDSA signatures. So really the cost of adding confidential transactions uh, to, to Bitcoin or to something like Bitcoin has now really become uh, very low and, 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 and much more into the realm of feasibility, right? This is, it, it's, it's not sort of, you know, uh, confidentiality, the cost of confidentiality or the cost of privacy has gone down. Yeah, the, the Schnorr with aggregation is, is, is somewhat better than ECDSA. Um, and you would probably still use a signature scheme, so you know this is obviously you know tweaking the numbers in the right way, but but still you know it just just shows you that it's not like you're doing something that is a thousand times more expensive than what you're currently doing. So would that give a further incentive for centralized parties such as Coinbase to have uh, batch transactions with bulletproof? Or? Yeah, I mean uh, the fees are sort of the fees would certainly be lower. This. It gets a little bit tricky. You probably have a system parameter where you say that uh, you allow at most 16 or 32. Sort of it works best if you sort of fix the number of uh, out, sort of if you put a cap on the number of outputs per transactions that you have uh, because of this batch verification. So you would probably say like, you know, 16 or 32 is, uh, you know, the max sort of that we support. And after that, you have to do two proofs. But yeah, who knows? I don't know. Uh, the, um, you know, this could also be done, you know, this, this, uh, this MPC can also be done through a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? But it can also be a service that provides this. And I don't think service providers are inherently evil. Well, I, mean, I, mean that, I mean, Coinbase and, and, and 
similar cities already do uh, batch transactions. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, like clearly, yeah, they, for them it would be great, right? Sort of large transactions with many outputs are, are sort of cheap. But I guess their outputs have more inputs. Like their transactions have many inputs and probably less outputs. I don't know. I uh, know they also have a lot of outputs because they need to pay out their customers. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's the same one. So I I, I promised to talk about uh, Zcash, and um, basically what Zcash the the core part of Zcash is is sort of this Merkle inclusion proof, and basically you need to do one inclusion proof per input to the transaction. So say you had one, then uh, the proving time would be 14 seconds. The verification time would be 480 milliseconds. However, if you if you uh, do the batch verification, then it's only 50 milliseconds. And checking a snark is about 10 milliseconds. And you know, say we you know, in generality we you know want to combine coins, so you need to have two inputs. So you take all these numbers by two, and then uh, on this this tiny machine, this two gigahertz machine, uh, it's like throttled down. Uh, proving is like 30 seconds. Verification is one second plus 100 milliseconds per transaction, and the proof size is about 1.3 kilobytes. And you know, hopefully, with with at least throwing a little bit more money at it, like more hardware, uh, you can get these numbers to be even better. So what does this mean? Well, you know, a snark verifying a snark is about 10 milliseconds, um, and uh, like it's it's probably like with the number of transactions that Zcash has right now, it's it's absolutely feasible. However, the question is, you know, sort of what if they scale up? Uh, and there's certainly a cost to it. Uh, but the big benefit is that now you don't have the trusted setup anymore. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. And and you know, I was at Zcon Zero talking with with Zuku and you know the people from Zcash, and and they're seriously considering sort of switching. To 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 Bulletproof, or at least I think it's at the very least it's worth investigating. I'm and it's yeah it's a, it be, it becomes a really really interesting question and challenge. Um, it doesn't seem completely infeasible, but it's also not free. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And <laughs> you can find all the you can find all the resources here on crypto.stanford.edu slash bulletproof. So there's links to the implementations and, and, and the paper. And uh, if you want to sort of uh, see my personal work, it's uh, crypto.stanford.edu slash tilde B-U-E-N-Z. So yeah, thank you very much. And let me know if you have more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedict. Thank you to TechLit for having us here. Thank you all for coming. Now uh, I'm sure that it will stay a while longer to answer any questions. But after that, as some of you might know, right across the street from here is the Bitcoin Embassy. So you're welcome to visit while you're here. And after that, every <coughs> Wednesday evening, we have a gathering at Toy Lab in Montefiore 31. It's a five minutes walk from here. So after you finish up here, you're welcome to join over there. Thank you.